Hello dear friends. The topic of today's video is the memory of a German officer, Eric Klein. He was a typical German officer of that time. Past the Polish, French and Yugoslav campaigns. He also participated in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Let's start with his childhood. Let's try to understand what influenced his views at a very young age. We will also get acquainted with the stage of formation of an ordinary German officer. Do not forget to rate the video and leave your opinion about this work. Well, we are starting. I was born on February 25, 1919 in Arnswald, the historical territory of Newmark, now this territory belongs to Poland. There I went to school and graduated from it. I was the eldest of two sons, and thanks to my parents who lived in the city and my grandparents who lived in the countryside, my childhood passed in a happy unity with nature. My brother was a year and a half younger than me. As students, we traveled a lot during the holidays. We have been to East Prussia, Bavaria, Austria, Switzerland and Holland. We had such special train tickets that gave us the right to free travel. They were arranged for us by my father who worked for the German state railways. My mother, who at one time received the specialty of a dressmaker, led the household. The four of us often took bicycle rides, as well as trips to grandparents, where they had a peasant farmstead. In addition, we went to our relatives in Kurt and Hassendorf. My carefree childhood was spent in the city and in the countryside, approximately equally. From 1925 I began to attend a men's school, and already four years later, a reform gymnasium opened in Arnswald in 1927. We studied French from the sixth grade, English from the junior division of the fourth and fifth grades, and Latin from the junior division of the sixth and seventh grades. In the junior department of the fourth and fifth grades, five girls from the women's high school joined us. Approximately half of the students came to study on bicycles from other places. Bechstein Piano by the Gymnasium laid the foundation for music lessons, and later for the emergence of the student choir and the school orchestra. I played the violin in it. Together with me, Crystal played music on the same instrument Bulo, daughter of a music teacher and future godmother of my son Paul. In the choir I sang alto, and when I got older, base. Along with this, we had biology, horticulture, geographical and other circles, as well as sports sections. At the senior level, we took several days of cycling outings more than once. School-wide services that took place every Monday also played an important role. Concert programs were organized at the end of the week. Some of them, by teachers, in the rest, we, the students, also took part in groups. On the last step, we all proudly wore our gymnasium caps, trimmed with green at the bottom, with a red middle part and a black velvet top. The rest wore different colors, the lower grades were blue, the middle grades were yellow, and the graduates were white stripes. In 1933, the Reform Gymnasium was renamed the Complete Secondary School for Boys and Girls. The Assembly Hall became the place where all events were held, concerts of the Dresden Violin Quartet, presentations with slideshows about painting and poetry, school celebrations, performances by our orchestra and choir. Here, the students met with their teachers on a non-standard basis. The initiator of such meetings was the director of the school, Dr. Krush. This year, nothing hurt him more painfully than the end of what he devoted his whole life to. The district town of 13,000, despite its small population, could boast of several sports societies. The most notable was the Registered Men's Sports Society, founded in 1861, which was part of the German Sports Society. It was known far beyond Arnswald for its successes. I can proudly report that I was a member of it and was repeatedly awarded certificates of honor and crowned with an oak wreath for my achievements. I was 14 years old when the political system changed in Germany. As schoolchildren, 
we could not stand aside from the catastrophic phenomena in the country's economy in previous years. However, the interests of the students were different, some were in the Pathfinders, others in the youth party organizations. Outside the school walls, I belonged to the German Free Rifleman Tourist Group, my brother Werner and I went in for sports, made hiking and cycling trips. Joining the Hitler Youth in May 1933 was painful for some, but one can hardly speak of any kind of coercion here. In general, we strive to be useful to the country. And the people's community, which we still had to face, was not an empty phrase for us. We have experienced years of devastation, the fall of moral values, unemployment, not provided with any social guarantees. These phenomena were caused by initially unfeasible colossal reparations and inflation. Against the backdrop of these events, in 1935, I, a typical representative of young people obsessed with hiking and excursions, became a scarf for a Hitler youth. I must say that for all its ambiguity, the members of this organization did not rush headlong into politics or persecution of representatives of other peoples. Rather, they were just individualists. Traveling, in the company of my brother, on a bicycle or by rail, was not affected by my membership in H.J. Sometimes one of our school friends would join us. The three of us, Ernst and my brother, visited the Rhine and Ruhr region. Our train ride through the Danzig corridor shocked us. The windows in the cars were closed, the doors too, in each car there was a Polish border guard with a weapon. In Dershaw, the railway line ended, then we rode bicycles, and at the border of Poland and Danzig, Polish customs officers thoroughly searched our luggage and demanded to pay a fee for the food that our parents gave us on the road. We tried to persuade them, but the Poles were inexorable. Then we sat on the sidelines and began to eat the emergency supply, and only after that they let us through. It was this example that influenced our views on Danzig. We rode on our bicycles to Konigsberg, and there we stopped at Grandfather and Grandmother Gunther. For Brother Werner and I, these travels were very eventful and generally instructive. There were no slopes too steep for us, no mountains too high, no snow too deep. We did not miss a single castle, not a single museum. For the Christmas holidays of 1935, we climbed into Riesensburg, where we skied to our heart's content. I must say that all of the above travels took place in very harsh, Spartan conditions. Sometimes we spent the night in youth hotels, but more often we preferred a tent. After each trip, we carefully wrote down the impressions and even published them in our local newspaper. We saved the paid fees to finance the next trips. In general, we tried to earn money for travel ourselves, doing tutoring or earning extra money on the sugar beet harvest. The nearby Lake Sea, connected to two more lakes, provided an opportunity for swimming and rowing. It is worth mentioning our dance classes, which ended, as it was then, with a solemn ball, and walks from six to seven in the evening, which all the city's youth went out to. Although the National Socialists adopted a lot from the former youth associations, including both uniforms and forms of recreation, the spirit of the former unions was gradually replaced by the ideology of the new regime, which sought to treat everyone with the same brush. In the autumn of 1936, an unpleasant surprise awaited us, it was decided to reduce the period of study from nine years to eight, while maintaining the volume of the curriculum. Thus, we were forced to study in the afternoon, previously free, hours. Our level passed exams in March 1937. This significantly reduced the opportunities for free time. However, 15 people successfully passed the exams and graduated from high school. What did you do after you left school, how did you get in the army? Already on April 1, 1937, we received summons to work out the prescribed six months, as part of the Imperial Labor Service. I got to work in logging. 
Approximately 150 of my peers were stationed in the barracks of the camp, which was located in the forest. We were led by experienced professionals. But after the expiration of the prescribed six months, an order was suddenly received to extend the period of work to seven months, due to the need for harvesting in agriculture. Then I planned to join the army for two years, and then continue my education at the Technical University in Breslau. Upon its completion, he was going to get a job in the port, either Stetten or Hamburg. So on November 4, 1937, I was overjoyed when I was assigned to the 68th Motorized Artillery Regiment. Military training turned out to be very intense, I got the impression that it was me, as a potential applicant, that they decided to teach as it should be. My comrade and I often came to the attention of junior commanders, and we were accused of looseness, and sometimes almost sabotage. For this, I had to pay for dismissal to the city on weekends. We were trained in handling light machine guns, taught to work on walkie-talkies in any conditions, handle 150 mm howitzers, and drive all types of vehicles. At the training grounds, the skills of attack and defense were debugged in conditions close to a combat situation, training firing with live ammunition and projectiles was carried out. On October 1, 1938, I was awarded the rank of corporal, and it was also announced that I was a candidate reserve officer and deputy instructor. The battery commander Hauptmann Helling ordered me to report to the battalion commander. There I was informed that I was included in the group of the most suitable officer candidates. Parental consent was required because I had not yet reached the age of 20, the age of majority. During the short vacation granted to me, I managed to persuade my father to give me permission, although he did not show much enthusiasm. Then, after a two-day examination in Stetton, I was promoted to the Fan Junkers and was transferred to the 2nd Motorized Artillery Regiment stationed in Stetton. The officer's service was difficult, but interesting. It required complete dedication, but it brought real satisfaction, after all, from now on you were admitted to the officer's casino and had every right to ride horses with might and main. The bulk of the officer corps was far from politics, as for non-commissioned officers and enlisted personnel, in this sense, they did not know at all what it was. Yes, we did not need to interfere in politics, it simply did not interest us. We did not have voting rights, were not members of any of the parties, the only thing left for us was submission to higher commanders and superiors. Although we did not form the policy ourselves, the policy was formed with our help. I started the Polish campaign as a non-commissioned officer. Our unit was transferred through East Prussia to be deployed in Brest. Did you start your service as a soldier of the 60th Infantry Division? No, she was later. I started the Polish campaign in the 2nd Motorized Stetten Division. An artilleryman as part of a motorized artillery unit, a 105mm howitzer, a motorized howitzer unit. This campaign was a real blitzkrieg, it ended very quickly. In about two or three days, with our division, we went through Poland to East Prussia, and from there through Lamsa to Brest. There was very little fighting and shooting in this war. Did you meet the Soviet troops in Brest? Yes, we saw them, but there was no contact with them. There we ran into politics, having entered the city before the Soviet troops, but not knowing that they decided to draw a border there. My commander reported, upstairs, about the arrival of the unit in the city, and he was ordered to urgently leave it, which we quickly did. After that, Soviet units entered there. Then my officer career began. At the end of the Polish campaign, courses for artillery officers in Jutterbog followed, then on April 1, 1940, I was awarded the rank of lieutenant, and I was transferred to the troops, to the artillery battalion of the 601st Motorized Infantry Regiment. Major Haupt commanded the battalion, Oberleutnant von Malachowski was my battery commander. Let's back to the Polish campaign. 
It is believed that the poles provided strong resistance in breast. Did you feel it? No. Did you participate in the parade in Brest? No. What was your responsibilities as an officer? I was a lieutenant in a motorized heavy howitzer unit, served in the position of an advanced observer. This means that I was in the closest contact with the infantry. My task was to carry out its early support in a certain area. This is an advanced position on the front. Artillery supports the infantry attack with the help of an observer who takes control of the fire and also provides support in the form of heavy artillery on demand so that the attack occurs in a coordinated manner so that there is no firing at friendly other surprises so that it develops evenly for this there is an advanced observer located at the very front edge of the front line he also monitors the actions of the enemy and from there from his position coordinates the fire. How did artillery guns be transported in your unit? By car. We had a fully motorized unit, in which supply, logistics, march control and so on were perfectly established. On May 10, 1940, the attack on France began. I participated in the French campaign, serving in a motorized division of heavy howitzers. It was an artillery unit of the reserve of the high command. We went to the very south of the country, and ended up in Lyon, where we communicated very closely with the locals when the hostilities had already ended. I was fluent in French, which I learned at school. And, thanks to me, many ties with the French began with us. In general, the Wehrmacht had well-trained personnel. We were far better prepared for war than the British and French, who were still fighting the old-fashioned way. Only one of our battalions took part in repelling the attack of the British, who came to help the French. They were almost instantly defeated. They did not want to be captured, so they were told to go home. And the main part of the division continued to move south, and that battalion then joined us. The French campaign, like the Polish one, was a real blitzkrieg. In the course of military operations, we went through Belgium, Holland, Luxembourg. After our troops broke through the defense lines of the Belgians and the Dutch, the Allied forces in northern France were tied up, which greatly reduced their operational capabilities. The Allies did not count on any blitzkrieg. Among the ten divisions of the British Expeditionary Force, not a single armored one was found. As a forward observer, I ensured the advance of our infantry forces on the main directions in the area near the Ainoos Canal. For this, I was awarded the Iron Cross, second class. I remember that Bisankin, Lyon and Dijon were taken without firing a shot. On June 22, 1940, the German-French armistice was signed in the Compiègne Forest. The artillery battalion of the 601st Motorized Infantry Regiment was transferred to Pomerania to the training ground, where it was included in the 3rd Artillery Regiment of the newly formed 60th Motorized Infantry Division. After lengthy exercises using new equipment, the division was redeployed to Austria. This happened in November 1940. What was the difference between the French and Polish campaign? Was the French harder or was more fighting? French was easier in terms of language. Also, she was more, so to speak, human. In the Polish campaign, nationalist sentiments prevailed. And they came from the Polish population. After all, Poland became an independent state only after the First World War, before that it was divided. Since then, the Poles have been trying all the time to expand their territory at the expense of Germany, to capture Danzig, to advance into West Prussia and East, to crush more under themselves. And this position found wide support in the ruling circles. The Russians have also experienced this. But in the end, the Poles did not calculate their strength, they wanted a lot, and overdid it, as they say. And from the point of view of battle, was the battle in France harder than in Poland? In France, 
the fighting was a little harder. Because the French were well armed, they built up a line of defense, they gained combat experience before the start of this campaign. The French army courageously defended itself, but could not oppose our onslaught. Indeed, in such circumstances, the success of a motorized unit depends 40% on movement and 60% on firepower. The units that neglected such an important component of the attack as movement, relying on firepower, can be said to have made a team miscalculation and did not use their chance. Of course, we had a very bold maneuver, and any bold action entails the emergence of risks, which are always sufficient without it. Did you participate in the Yugoslav campaign? Yes. After the French campaign, I was posted to the Danzig Division, the 60th Infantry, stationed in Danzig. Its residents served in it, students, policemen. The division arose on the basis of a combat working squad during the Polish campaign. Then the unit was motorized, and he was given the designation 60th Infantry Motorized Danzig Division. In its composition, at the beginning of February 1941, we were transferred by rail through Hungary to Romania, to the place of our deployment. Here the division received training status. But already on March 2, 1941, we, this time under our own power, were again transferred to the Plovdiv region. In Bulgaria, nicknamed Balkan Prussia, we were greeted with emphatic friendliness. We watched with interest the customs and everyday life of the Bulgarians. I ended up staying in the same family I remember this episode, an ancient old woman, with a gesture telling me to squat down, puts a cross around my neck, adding that I have to go through a long war, and this cross will protect me from dangers. And I carried this cross until the war was over. In Plovdiv I was transferred to the battalion headquarters. The new commander was the reserve Hauptmann, doctor of jurisprudence Hilger from Danzig. He was glad to see help in my face, after all, the only military officer among his many subordinates, mainly students of the Danzig Technical University. I was appointed to the position of an officer in the infantry regiment of the 120th Motorized Infantry Division, the commander was Colonel von Gradek. I carried out the communications of the 4th Artillery Battalion. Albanians and Italians then invaded Serbia, and there was a war with Greece. On April 8, 1941, having crossed the border of Yugoslavia, we managed to advance to the very border with Greece. The Italian troops there failed, starting a war with Albania on March 9, 1941. The British expeditionary force was operating against us in Greece. The strike group von Gradek, operating as part of the 5th Panzer Division, crossed the border of Greece, attacked the British and reacted neutrally to the Greeks. The British Corps was forced to retreat, leaving behind heavy weapons and vehicles, however, in the area of the Thermopylae Gorge and on the coast of the Gulf of Corinth, they still managed to escape by sea due to the rear guard. On April 19, 1941, the Greek campaign was completed. The inhabitants of the Peloponnese and Sparta solemnly welcomed the Wehrmacht, seeing us as liberators from the Italians. In May 1941 we were sent to rest in Austria. On your own, through Belgrade, Budapest and Vienna. Did you serve the same position then? Yes, as before. I served in the position of an advanced observer. Our battery also performed training functions, for example, in Romania and Bulgaria we acted as an exemplary unit. Romanian and Bulgarian artillerymen turned to us with questions and asked for advice. Everything was done in a friendly manner, we were received there as guests. What was your attitude to your allies, Romanians, Bulgarians? friendly. The Bulgarians called themselves Balkan Prussia. And then, quite unexpectedly, we were transferred from Bulgaria to Greece. And in Greece there were the British, who fought there with the Italians. That is, with our invasion of Greece, we supported the Italians, 
and the British immediately retreated. The Greeks refused to fight against us, we did not touch them, and again such friendly relations arose between us and the Greeks that the Greeks later told us that we had liberated them from the Italians, they were very grateful to us. When the division, already after the Greek campaign, after Romania, was transferred to the border with the Soviet Union? Somewhere in May it was. We were transferred back to Lower Austria, where we were at the time of the attack on the Soviet Union as a reserve division, and from there we were transferred through Lvov somewhere near Kiev, where we took the first battle with the Soviet troops. That is, we did not take part in the first stage of the invasion. Was the war with the Soviet Union a surprise for you, or was it waiting to one or other degree? In general, we thought about such a prospect. But in general, like the campaign in the Balkans, this war came as a surprise, although it nevertheless became the result of processes in which we, as soldiers, participated, but could not know about them in advance. We thought that everything would pass, as in Poland and the Balkans. When did you learn that the war with the Soviet Union will begin? He didn't tell me about it, but the commander of the 120th Motorized Infantry Regiment, Colonel von Gradek, for whom I served as a communications officer, even hinted. This colonel had some relatives in diplomatic circles. When did it happen? I found out when we were taken away from Greece. Somewhere ten days before the start of the war. Everyone was wondering, what's next? Nobody, of course, knew anything. And no one officially reported this, I learned this only thanks to my personal connections in the headquarters of Colonel von Gradek. What did you do at the very beginning of the war? We were busy securing the unified advance of the troops, who were on a wide march. We have tuned into a new direction, a new war. This is a very complex process, the advancement of troops along the roads. Depending on the country, the conditions for the advancement of troops differ, and the study of these conditions requires time and knowledge. And as a soldier, I was focused on my daily work. On June 22, we learned about the attack on the Soviet Union without a declaration of war, that is, about the start of Operation Barbarossa. The 60th Motorized Infantry Regiment, operating as part of the Kleist Tank Group, arrived in Zydemir and Berdichev on July 9 via Nysa, Krakow, Lvov to conduct the first hostilities on the Eastern Front. We found ourselves face to face with an enemy we had never yet fought in combat. Where was your first fight? Somewhere near Zydemir. There we saw another war for the first time. We entered some Russian area, and there, before our arrival, Russian reconnaissance infantrymen were taken prisoner, and very cruelly executed. These were the first victims of the war that we saw. It made a huge impression on us. And what we saw made us understand that this war will not be like the previous ones. What feeling did you have before it started? That it will last long, or that it will be a blitzkrieg again? Of course, we hoped that this war would be the same as the previous ones, a blitzkrieg, that we would find a common language with the population. We, in Bulgaria and Bessarabia, had no problems at all with this. Residents of those countries joined us, and we performed together. Subsequently, the Cossacks began to join us, I remember that their battalion fought on our side, in the ranks of which there were even civilians. He fought in the sector of the 6th Panzer Division. But in the days of the Soviet Union, it was impossible to talk about it. Another question about the period of the beginning of the war. How different the campaign against the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941 from the campaign in Poland and France? I had combat experience gained in different countries, I understood the science of army management. The troops were determined to win, to quickly achieve superiority by joint efforts in all directions, there was complete confidence in the command among the troops, one for all and all for one. 
It was the same in Russia when we overcame the first Russian defensive lines, and this was the case when we began to move into new territories from Zydomir to Dnipropetrovsk, and from there to the region to the Sea of Azov. In November 1941 we were already in the region of Taganrok and Rostov-on-Don. I still served as a liaison officer for von Gradek, and I saw that the command had similar feelings. Well, then, it was winter. And it was the first serious shock. We will get to winter. Let's back to summer. Then our division moved to the area of Dnipropetrovsk. There was an offensive. We, bypassing Kiev, walked in the direction of the bend of the Dnieper. The river was forced, and a bridgehead was created on its eastern bank in the Dnipropetrovsk region, which we held until the end of the encirclement battle in the Kiev region. I was wounded in the left hand, but remained in the unit. On October 4, 1941, the 60th Motorized Infantry Regiment struck south along the eastern bank of the Dnieper and captured Zaporozhye, where Hungarian units were operating on the western bank. Did you see any peculiarities in the behavior of the Soviet troops during your advance to Dnipropetrovsk? Were the soldiers demoralized or behaved differently? There was an impression that the cohesion of the Soviet troops was not the same as it was in previous battles. It was felt that they were crushed, not confident in themselves, but standing behind them and holding them within the framework of a strict command that does not allow them to relax. And so, there was uncertainty, they themselves surrendered. What did you know about Russia before the war? Generally, a little. I had never been there before, although I traveled a lot around Europe as a schoolboy. I learned about Russia from Baltic Germans living in Riga and from acquaintances who worked in the diplomatic corps in St. Petersburg. This was before the Stalin period. Then Stalin, as I imagined, made socialism out of communism. He said that only through the dictatorship of socialism would we achieve communism. That is, the total planting of socialism, all human down with it, of course, was a struggle against our own people. Against the middle class, against citizens who had their own opinion. They were crushed by the state machine. Even later, we learned about such things as, a third of the country was sitting, a third of the country is sitting, and the other third is still sitting. What amazed you most when you found in the Soviet Union? We have seen that in these vast expanses, a lot of things can be done, improved, in terms of infrastructure, construction, in all spheres of life. We saw that the Soviet people are open. Can you say you were awesome by their poverty? Yes, poverty resulting from lack of progress. Your division passed through Lviv. Have you heard anything about the events in Lvov? about the Nachtigal Battalion. In Lvov, I witnessed one event that horrified me. The Poles were involved in it. We couldn't do anything about it, we couldn't influence it, and I was a liaison officer and was constantly on the road. I saw a lot, but it shocked me. In the autumn your division was in the Rostov-on-Don region, did you always know that the war was delaying on? In the course of the offensive against Mariupol, located on the shores of the Sea of Azov, we, acting as part of the 3rd Tank Corps of General Mackensen, were involved in fierce battles that coincided in time with the onset of rains and autumn thaws. There could be no question of any swift throw, the technique was hopelessly bogged down in the mud. And yet, under these conditions, we managed to capture the largest center, Rostov-on-Don, and the village located near the city. Major Hilger was awarded the German Cross in gold, and I was awarded the Iron Cross first class. Near Rostov we were caught by unpleasant news. Rather, in the steps between the Volga and the Don. There we learned that Japan had declared war on America and that the Red Army had received fresh reinforcements from Siberians. We did not expect such a surprise. On November 28, 1941, at a temperature of minus 25 degrees, 
We were suddenly attacked by the elite Siberian units of the Russians, and were forced to leave their positions so as not to be cut off from the rear support. Fresh Russian divisions were advancing on us across the steppe on a wide front, and we stood, unable to oppose anything to them. Then we retreated to the mouth of the Meuse River and entrenched ourselves there. This was our first fighting retreat, which cost us considerable casualties. A defensive front was created along the Meuse River to Taganrok itself. As a result, the Russian offensive stalled in this sector, although they were able to break through in the Kharkov direction thanks to the introduction of the latest T-34 tanks into battle. And the second trouble was the winter, for which we did not prepare in any way. This also applied to clothing and supplies. And this was the cause of deep disappointment, which soon set in among the troops. The combat readiness of the German troops significantly decreased not only due to frost, but also as a result of more and more new divisions constantly being thrown into battle by the enemy. The deliveries of weapons and equipment were carried out through Iran, which since August 1941 has been occupied by parts of the Russians and the British. On May 17, 1942, southwest of Izium, the division crushed them with a sudden blow to the rear of the Russian tank forces that had broken through. In the course of the offensive to the east, already in the bend of the Don, interruptions in the supply of troops began to be felt. In the Don steppes, villages were located only along numerous small rivers, and the possibilities for quartering troops in them were very limited. As for provisions, there was nothing to count on in these villages. During the retreat from Rostov, who was a big enemy for you, the Red Army or the winter weather? The Red Army and our supply. The roads were broken during the autumn thaw, so we chose to retreat to the Meuse we needed a good bridgehead. And in the Meuse area, such a bridgehead was found, the river became the front line, and we could hold it. And in the north, of course, Soviet troops broke through and deepened the offensive. What did you do during the cold? How did you save? Gradually learned to cope. They began to deliver winter things to us, which were collected in Germany and then transferred to the front. It took time. This could have been avoided if we had been prepared. Such unpreparedness became a big nuisance for the soldiers. What personally would you have combat with the cold? I learned to endure the cold, although it was very difficult. We wrapped ourselves in clothes. We helped each other, woke up so as not to freeze in a dream. This was new for us, we had not been able to do this before. In the Red Army, Alcohol was included in the daily diet, and how did the German soldiers do it? We took with us something from France, but I can't say that the troops constantly consumed alcohol. After the defeat near Moscow and Rostov, is it possible to say that the moral state of the German troops declined, or was it supported somehow? Disappointment was present, but at the same time, the fighting spirit was preserved. It cannot be said that the soldiers one day said, that's it, we don't want to fight anymore. Some time passed, and again came the good news about the victories in May-June. Please evaluate the moral state of the Soviet troops in the winter of 1942. What can you say about this? Both sides were disappointed. On our side, 40% of the troops were allies, representatives of other European countries, the French, Romanians, Italians, Croats, Finns. And after Stalingrad, they stopped fighting. Before Stalingrad, everything was fine, everyone fought. We survived the winter, and with the onset of spring, they began to say that if it continues like this before winter, they will go home. Were there any limitations on the number of shots and ammunition during the periods when there were supply problems? As for ammunition, we spent it sparingly, but we were never afraid to spend it. IT is known that German artillery, particularly heavy, fired more than Soviet. Did you feel it, and what is the reason for it? The artillery command has always devoted a lot of time to the joint work of artillery, infantry, and engineering troops. 
All commanders had an excellent military education, and the troops were well trained. Logistics has always been great. The success of artillery was achieved by zeroing in, and if an attack was required somewhere without the support of artillery, then the gunners still helped to prepare the strike along with other branches of the military. What vehicles did your division have? We were provided with motorized means of transportation. We had a car, there was a mobile radio station for coordinating actions with the Luftwaffe during the battle, there were mobile observation posts. Until Stalingrad, everything was in order with transport. Is the mood in the troops up in connection with the success of the spring offensive? The mood in the troops was restrained, it did not improve. We held each other, we knew our position. We knew that it would be more difficult further, there would be problems with provision, because of the roads, because of the steps, because of the actions of partisans, whose strength was taken seriously. Was it already known about the partisan? Were afraid of them? Personally, I had not heard about them before Stalingrad. But after him, the partisans appeared in large numbers. Near Mogilev, on the Berezina. Was the opportunity to go on vacation? I haven't been on vacation for three years. The offensive of the 60th Division was stopped under Stalingrad. Why and how did it happen? On August 19, 1942, from the headquarters of the 6th Army under the command of Colonel General Paulus, an order was received to attack in the Stalingrad direction. On August 21, a bridgehead was created in the Kalakandan region, thanks to which the 14th Panzer Corps and the 60th Motorized Infantry Division operating in its composition, together with the 16th Panzer Division and the 3rd Motorized Division, broke through to Stalingrad through Kalak and ended up at the northern edge of the city. However, the infantry lagged behind us, and the conditions for conducting the battle deteriorated greatly, because it was from the north of Stalingrad that the Soviet units approached. For us, there was a threat of encirclement. It fell to the 14th Panzer Corps to endure very tense weeks, and even really get surrounded by the Russians. Combat support was carried out with the help of tanks, and thus it was possible to create a military foothold in the north of the city. However, it was impossible to engage in street fighting, because the troops were weakened. Then the 4th and 6th armies, as well as the Romanians, approached from the south. A big problem, an unpleasant reality, was the street fighting in Stalingrad, the German troops were not ready for them. What can you tell about street fights? I didn't have to participate in them. I was constantly at the division's location as an adjutant to the commander of the artillery battalion of the 160th Artillery Regiment. Then I was already a senior lieutenant, I had a platoon under my command. I had only one independent trip to the city, to get an idea of backslash U 200 B backslash U 200 what is happening there and compare with the situation in the northern part of the city. The losses were large, and the successes in street fighting were modest, since the troops were not replenished. The Luftwaffe bombed the city, but this brought only severe destruction, but these bombings did not lead to military victories. In the future you were transferred to the north. After the Luftwaffe finished the bombing, we, the artillerymen, had to carry out the planned shelling of the city. In this way, we made it easier for the infantry which was supposed to enter the battle after artillery preparation, but this was not aimed shooting, but simply shelling squares, one squad shoots there, the other here. And this method often caused surprise. By September 15, 1942, with the capture of the main station, most of Stalingrad was in the hands of German troops. However, the industrial enterprises of the northern and southern parts of the city were still under the control of the Russians. Actually, the city occupies a strip up to 8 kilometers wide along the western bank of the Volga. It is this strip that forms the center of Stalingrad, which stretches for as many as 35 kilometers. Positional warfare on the streets and in the ruins of the houses of the city was not envisaged. Did you participate in counter-artillery actions? 
We, of course, were involved in such actions, but at the same time we had to be strict with ammunition, save shells, there was simply no supply. And in general, you had to be careful, because the danger could come from anywhere, and there were fewer and fewer people left, both in transportation and in supplies. Sometimes there was a feeling that you were left to the mercy of fate. And the mood in the troops was often terrible. What did you do when the message was received about the beginning of the offensive of the Soviet troops on November 19th? Personally, I then went home. My younger brother served as a lieutenant, and died near Demyansk on February 22, 1942. Then there was an opportunity to recall a soldier from the army, if the parents had an only son. And my parents filed such a request after the death of my brother. In November 1942, I received a statement sent by my parents to the authorities about my recall, as the only surviving son, from the units of the army in the field. However, taking into account the complexity of the situation in this area, I said that I would stay with my battalion in Stalingrad, because I felt that I could not leave everything there. Major Hilger accepted my decision with full understanding, but insisted that I still explain my motives to my parents. He said, go home, stay there for two to three days, discuss everything with your parents, and then return to the front. Because I want to go on vacation after you to Danzig and be there with my family for Christmas, and one of us needs to stay here at the front all the time. And then I decided that I would go. After three years at the front, I went on vacation with the condition of returning by mid-December, which would allow Major Hilger to go on vacation and spend Christmas in his native Danzig with his wife and children. In general, it turned out that during the battles I was at home. In Arnswald, I explained to my father and mother the motives that prompted me to stay in Stalingrad, and for a short time I enjoyed the half-forgotten feeling that I was wearing civilian clothes. Saying goodbye to my parents stirred up a storm of conflicting emotions in me, and the OKH reports on the encirclement of the army broadcast on the radio on November 22 did not at all inspire optimism. And the path to my unit was not easy. I was appointed as a battery commander in one of the regiments of the 6th Tank Division of the Manstein Army, which was tasked with releasing our units that were surrounded. But since the enemy managed to force the Italian troops to retreat and capture Kharkov far to the west, the operation to release our troops at Stalingrad was cancelled. Of the 160,000 soldiers of the 6th Army, about 28,000 wounded were evacuated by air from the combat zone. 90,000 people fell into Soviet captivity, of which only 6,500 survived. As a senior lieutenant and battery commander of the 7th Battalion of the 76th Regiment, I remained in the 6th Tank Division, constantly interacting with the 11th Tank Regiment. That is, in the central sector of the front. In the meantime, Kharkov was recaptured from the Russians, and our units began to regroup for the summer offensive. The battery is four artillery pieces, 15 centimeters each. All in armor. Plus, armored observation vehicles, armored trucks. The firing range is up to 21 kilometers. Were these self-propelled guns, or were they required to transport them? Yes, it was required. Self-propelled vehicles appeared later, when I was sent to the location of the Danzig Division in the south of France. All those who retreated from Stalingrad, along with units of the 6th Panzer Division, were sent there for reorganization. New types of weapons for us were self-propelled armored 105mm howitzers, tank-based mobile observation posts equipped with false guns, and amphibians. There I became the commander of a battery of VESP guns, caliber 105mm, on the Panzer-2 chassis. We also had an observation tank based on the Panzer-3 with a dummy gun and a 6cm anti-aircraft gun for combating aircraft. The battalion commander was Hauptmann Schult, with whom I established friendly relations. At one time he also went through a school in Jutterbog 
and understood a lot about train personnel. Little by little, the staffing table was completed, equipment and weapons were delivered. There were difficult days of combat preparation for serious battles. In the meantime, a new formation of the Danzig Division was being carried out in France. The 60th Mechanized Infantry Division became the Mechanized Infantry Division, Feldhernhall. The surviving servicemen again found ground under their feet. In September 1943, the Feldhernhall Motorized Infantry Division was given the task of disarming the Italian 8th Army, stationed along the Mediterranean coast of France in connection with the Putsch, and then take over the protection of the sea coast. In October-November 1943, the division was transferred by rail to northern France. Maneuvers are also carried out there in the presence of Guderian's generals. On December 10, 1943, the division was again urgently transferred by rail to the site of Army Group Center in the Vitebsk region. There, along the entire front, defensive battles were in full swing, requiring urgent reconnaissance of the area. On January 18, 1944, the battle ended with huge losses for our troops. The losses of the Red Army amounted to 40,000 soldiers, in addition, 1,200 tanks and 350 guns were destroyed. Regarding this winter campaign, I can say that our division did not participate in it as a whole, we were divided in two, and this is the other part that participated in the battles and suffered heavy losses. This separation of the artillery battalion is a fact beyond the scope, armored units must fight as a single unit. Soviet veterans in their memories mention that the German troops generally became different after Stalingrad, their mood changed. What can you say about this? The attitude has changed because a large number of troops, 40% of the Allies, which I spoke about earlier, Italians, Romanians, Croats, left the front. No, they didn't die, they just stopped fighting with us. They were worse armed than the German troops. But after their departure, the number of troops decreased, and among the German soldiers a desire arose to find a political solution, because it was not possible to resolve the situation by military means. True, a soldier obeys orders and trusts command. And we really trusted our command. How did you take the transfer to France? How has the vacation been? No. It was a new formation of the Danzig Division. And everyone who returned to the division after the front or from vacation felt like a part of it. And this was the basis of a new military unit that was born in the south of France. There, the division simultaneously served as an occupation unit. During this period, the Americans landed in southern Italy, and the Italian army capitulated. The entire southern front, on which the Italians fought, ceased to exist, and their army was disarmed. How was the transfer to the Eastern Front perceived among the officers? How punished? Because there was more chance to die or missing? No, it was not perceived as a punishment. If a soldier was convicted, then he was sent to a special unit or a penal company. Such a phenomenon, of course, also existed. In the winter of 1944, were you already in Vitebsk? Yes, and from there in January he was relocated to Narva. In connection with the transition to the offensive of the Red Army units near Leningrad, on January 24, 1944, we were sent there by rail and partly by plane, and without delay they were thrown into the thick of battles. In Narva I was commander of the battery of Vesp guns, as before. My commander, Hauptmann Schult, fell there. In this situation, I took command of an artillery battalion, which included four batteries. For participation in the battles, I was awarded the German cross in gold and the rank of Hauptmann, counting from February 1, 1944. From that moment I began my career as a battalion commander. I am appointed commander of the 1st Artillery Battalion of the 1st Artillery Regiment, Feldhernhall. 
Soon the command said that they needed a highly qualified battalion commander, and I was sent to study at the tank and artillery schools for a period of six weeks. What was the difference in handling with a conventional gun and with the self-propelled VESP? The weapon was the same. But in a self-propelled gun, the shells lay inside, plus ammunition was carried behind the self-propelled guns in armored vehicles. There were no differences in the handling of the gun and in its shooting. The difference was in management. The observation tank drives ahead, determines the targets and instructs the battery to fire, fires from one gun, and thus gives the direction of fire to the others. That is, fire control comes from two self-propelled guns, from two observation points. One of them acts in front in the very first line of attack. As battery commander, I was in the observation tank. It was a Panzer three tank with a dummy gun, so that the enemy could not determine from which tank the fire was being controlled. And I was always in direct contact with the artillery command. And in front was an advanced observer. The battery commander was not on her own, but at the observation post, and on the battery was the so-called senior on the battery. At what distance from the front line and from the artillery battery did the observation tank operate? Differently. If the battery fires, it is stationary. The front moves, and she remains far behind. If at some point it becomes known that artillery support is not needed, then the battery is immediately moved closer to the advancing troops. This is the task that the battery commander or division commander must perform in a combat situation. Who made the selection of goals for the fire? Are you alone? Decisions are made by the commander of the artillery unit, coordinating them with the infantry. There are many targets, but the most dangerous target is chosen depending on the tasks of attack or defense. The decision is made individually. But this is not an individual decision, but a coordinated one, it depends, among other things, on the ammunition and weapons used. What did you use to observe the fight? Stereo tube? Or maybe you were observing with the nail eye? For a while there was a stereo tube. Then, on self propelled guns there were such devices that allowed for all round observation. Then there were devices for constant observation. There were also reconnaissance aircraft with which there was constant communication, they reported on the location of the enemy. How many radio stations did you have and what? Differently. There was a point from where communication was made with a reconnaissance aircraft. From another place, communication was made with the command of the regiment, division. It was a wired connection. Also, there were radio stations and there was a special radio operator who managed the whole process. How distribution was telephone communication at the forward? Not used at all. In the rear, was. How was the information encoded? Is Morse code used? Information was always encoded, no direct text. When it came to shifting the fire, then they spoke in plain text and ordinary negotiations in the troops were coded. There were special codes, or words were replaced by other words. This was necessary because the enemy had radio intelligence that recorded our ciphers, and if the enemy understood us, then he would have accurate information about our actions. And Morse code was also used. Of necessity. When it was necessary to convey something secret. Private messages were sent in plain text. We had to change keys every three days. Thus, the danger of deciphering them by the enemy was excluded. If you take 1941 and 1944, how did your attitude to the enemy changed and how did the enemy himself changed? Cardinally. In 1941, they thought that, here it is, another blitzkrieg. And that it will all be over soon. In 1944, the front became different, the logistics became different. No comparison. The work of the Luftwaffe changed, air superiority was lost, we were bombed on roads, on bridges, in cities, at stations, communication and supply lines were destroyed. 
The difference was very big. In 1944, the German soldiers were completely demoralized. There was a terrible overstrain, there were many suicides in the active army, especially in the area of Mogilev, Minsk and Berezino. There are many swamps in that region, and at that time there were a lot of partisans who attacked the German troops in small groups, drove them into impenetrable swamps, from which it was impossible to get out on solid ground, so many could not break through to Minsk, many simply set off on the run. The troops were left without support. And so it went until East Prussia itself. In March 1944, I was sent to the School of Tank Troops in Monster and to the Artillery School in Grossborn for a three-month command course. During my absence, the duties of the battalion commander were entrusted to Hauptmann Pabst. In June 1944, upon completion of the course, I returned to the Feldhernhall Motorized Infantry Division, which is on vacation and understaffing already near Mogilev. I report on the arrival to the commander of the regiment, send him greetings from my wife and inform him about the course. The activity of the partisans in the rear of the units of Army Group Center inspires fear. Partisans undermine railways, bridges, damage communication lines, set fire to warehouses. On June 22, 1944, as expected, the Red Army began a large-scale offensive operation. The Motorized Infantry Division, Feldhernhall, conducts a series of distracting attacks on the Dnieper bridgehead near Mogilev, but fails, because the enemy, including partisan detachments, comes to our rear, which creates a real threat of encirclement of a large group of German forces. A week later, after the start of the Soviet offensive in the 350-kilometer wide sector of Army Group Center, there were virtually no German forces left in Belarus. The Red Army continues its rapid advance to the west. Our losses amounted to 28 divisions, or 350,000 people. Our motorized infantry division also suffered heavy losses. Part of the soldiers and officers ended up in the hands of the Russians, and the scattered remnants managed to retreat through Minsk to East Prussia, to Danzig and Elbing. What can you say about the offensive of the Red Army on June 22, 1944? It was a very powerful attack. In Mogilev, we were dealt a blow to the very heart. We were supposed to start the retreat to the Berezina before we actually started it, but we did not receive an order to do so. We nevertheless began to retreat, and by that moment other troops began to leave for the road along which we were retreating, and the road was one way, there were many bridges on it, they were in poor condition, and a huge traffic jam formed. And during this retreat, somewhere between Mogilev and Berezino, I was wounded. This happened during a raid on a mobile observation post, as a result of shelling our tank from the air. I was sent first to a field hospital, and then, in a roundabout way, to a hospital in East Prussia. I asked the doctor to leave me at the front, but he was categorically against it. He also said that they would not dare to take my leg from me. They put me in an amphibious vehicle, and I drove it to the hospital, but he was no longer there, because he also began to retreat. I went to look for him, and found only in East Prussia. In general, my road there was full of adventures. How powerful was the Soviet aviation attacks? They were monstrous. On the Berezina, we defeated the entire air defense. Russian planes flew over the column, and dropped bombs on the heads of the retreating troops. I was wounded during an air raid. The situation was catastrophic, it defies description. Despair. In addition, the troops were left without command. Did you have any name for the Soviet storm planes? No. Just I know that some Germans called them cement bombs. No, I've never heard of it. The German aviation had so many concerns in the skies over Germany that it no longer found time for the front. This, too, was a great disappointment for the soldiers. What happened to you after your recovery? 
In August 1944, another formation of the Danzig Division was carried out at the training ground near Poznan. The formation was given the name Panzer Division Feldhernhall. Colonel Pape was appointed commander. The newly formed artillery regiment has two battalions. I became the commander of the 1st Battalion of Hummel self-propelled guns. These are 150mm howitzers on the chassis of the Panzer-4 tank. Very heavy self-propelled guns. I fought in an observation tank, as was the case with the VESP. Battery firing platoons are armed with six 150mm howitzers on self-propelled gun carriages and one anti-aircraft artillery platoon. Command and responsible positions are occupied by experienced frontline soldiers and non-commissioned officers who are striving to return to their former units, these are vacationers who survived after the Russian offensive on the central sector of the front, recovering and returning to the front. But most of the personnel are storekeepers from Elbing. I have been called to the headquarters of the OKH in Berlin. Colonel Markian receives me at the Wilhelmstrasse. I report to him on the course of the battles of our division in the central sector of the front. After two days of compiling a written report, I was demanded by Colonel General Guderian, who was at the Führer's headquarters in East Prussia. Control at headquarters was greatly strengthened due to the failed assassination attempt on July 20, 1944. I am grateful for the work done, but this is where it ends. By night train I return to Berlin, and from there, to Poznan, where work is done to capacity. In September 1944, our division, which had not yet really completed the formation stage, was transferred through Silesia and Slovakia to Hungary. My battalion, a headquarters battery and three fire platoons, was received very friendly. One Hungarian officer invited me to the estate. In Verplet, our officers continued intensive training in conditions close to combat. Already in October 1944, our formation was assigned the task of participating in the heated battle for Debrecen, in which the first Hungarian army failed. In the course of the following days, we were continuously transferred from one hot spot to another, under the Monar, in the bend of the Danube under Vak, and in the area of Budapest, where we had to resist the advancing enemy. In cooperation with the heroically fighting Hungarian units, we were able to repulse the enemy's attempts to attack us, using the possibilities of maneuver that remained for some time. The 1st Regiment of the Feldhernhall Division, which was not distinguished by high maneuverability, closing the gaps in the defense line with powerful fire, repelled the blows of the fiercely pressing enemy, not allowing him to carry out his plan. On December 9, 1944, the Feldhernhall Division entered the eastern bank of the Danube near the Hungarian capital to prevent enemy attempts to encircle it. However, due to the onslaught of the Russians, who used heavy weapons, and the Allied air strikes, we still failed to prevent the encirclement of Budapest. The Hungarian capital was in the enemy ring on December 25, 1944. Budapest was declared a fortress, which was held at the cost of the promises of a deblocking operation. In the cellars of destroyed buildings, side by side with soldiers and officers, there were thousands of civilians from all over Hungary. On February 5, 1945, during an intense bombing strike, I was bombarded with debris from a building right at my command post, after which I regained consciousness only a few hours later. When I woke up, I saw next to our divisional surgeon, Dr. Hubner. He and a group of Hungarian military doctors rushed me to the Gellert Hotel, where I was given the necessary assistance, then I was transferred to the catacombs, in which a field hospital was deployed. The battle for Budapest ended on February 11, 1945, after 50 days of fierce street fighting, often turning into hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy. The Hungarian and German units were ordered to break through. Since there was no single plan for a breakthrough, separate groups had to leave the encirclement.
The 661st man from the five German divisions reduced to a minimum of the necessary combat capability in the most difficult conditions managed to reach our defense line located 50 kilometers from Budapest. All hopes of breaking through the encirclement, as in Stalingrad, were in vain. And on February 12th, we, the wounded, were in danger of being captured by the Russians, not having the slightest idea what fate was in store for us. At first, we did not understand anything at all, there was darkness around us, only the cries and groans of the wounded, hunger, thirst and the absence of the slightest hope for the best. Three days later, a fire broke out in the catacombs. Only a few managed to survive. Our doctor managed to transfer me, along with others, to another hospital. Although I survived in this hell, I was in complete confusion, no connection with the part, no help, nothing. The unknown loomed ahead. Two years after Stalingrad and seven months after Mogilev and Minsk, the Danzig Division found itself in a catastrophic situation in Hungary as well. We, being convinced that Russia could not be easily defeated, nevertheless fought desperately for the survival of Germany. In the foreground there was and remained a sense of duty, camaraderie. We lived, as it were, on islands, interested only in what is important for the next day. And, if I now begin to list all the examples of courage, stamina and readiness for self-sacrifice of soldiers and officers of our units and subunits, then we simply will not have enough strength or time. Where was you hurt? I was wounded by a bomb explosion, a broken leg and concussion. A doctor from my division was lying next to me and caring for me. When he became confident that I would survive, I was transferred to the Skelet Hotel at night. There I was taken care of by divisional surgeons and a Hungarian doctor. I had an injured eye, fractures here and there, a knee. I was almost motionless. I was operated on there, there was a whole consultation. I survived. Here, then, I have a prosthesis here, a prosthesis here, my eyes looked in different directions, I later underwent eye surgery and now I can read without glasses. In general, like this. According to the doctors, there is no living space left on me, but, nevertheless, I am alive. Was the operation before the capture? Shortly before the capture. I was wounded on the 2nd of February, on the 12th of February Budapest capitulated. Before the hotel was besieged, I was again transferred to the casemate in the fortress, where I was already taken prisoner. What happened to you in the Soviet camps? After the end of hostilities on May 8, 1945, I spent more than one week in the Hanft Hospital, then we were transferred to a hastily created field hospital for the Germans, and in the month of July, to the Romanian port, from where we were already delivered to the Soviet Union via the Black Sea, where from Novichokovsk our diverse group of 600 people was sent to the Donbass. In the camp in the city of Shakti, we were assigned to coal mines, part of the group went to mine 5, the rest to mines 23 and 32. After the necessary disinfection procedures, we ended up behind barbed wire, shaved bald. It was time to get used to cabbage, lentil porridge, 600 gram rations of bread for the workers upstairs, and a kilogram ration for those who went down to the slaughter. The atmosphere is gradually changing for the better, they already communicate with us like human beings. Suffering bears fruit, we begin to learn Russian. I was sent to extract coal in mine number 23, three shift work, I chipped it with a pick, I raked it with a shovel. All hands and feet. Sometimes they announce an emergency, production rates jump up to 150%. Russian sentenced to forced labor seem to have managed to get comfortable here, they often overestimate the output figures. Some of them are former prisoners of the German camp. The bosses also have to lie and attribute later, when the coal is unloaded into freight cars. We understood all this, and made conclusions for ourselves, do not swim across the current. In 1948, two rather high-ranking NKVD officers arrived at the camp. They call me for interrogation, 
where they try to knock out a confession of guilt with their fists in the death of the Red Army parliamentarian Ostapenko in Budapest. Doesn't pass. This topic is no longer covered. I am being transferred to the main camp in Shakti. There I work already at the top, not in the face, I am engaged in the manufacture of mine racks from logs. In 1949, I was transferred to a special camp number 15. The prisoners of this camp are busy working in a quarry. In early December, the NKVD officers wanted to see me again. The question is, are you from the western zone of occupation or from the eastern one? I did not understand what they wanted from me, and in German I asked for clarification. Ignored. My Russian language was not taken into account, and they let me go. Beginning in December 1949, they began to take us to Rostov-on-Don to the NKVD. December 23, 1949 in the basements of the NKVD, with me in the same cell is Peter Hermes, who later, after being released from Soviet captivity, made a good career as a diplomat, first he became the ambassador of the Federal Republic in the United States, and later in the Vatican. On December 24, we are brought to a special court in Black Cars. In the dressing room, they are seated on the floor. Talking is prohibited. One by one they are called to the meeting room. Everything goes pretty fast. I, Eric Paul Klein, born in 1919. Without charge against me, without the right to defense, was sentenced to death as a war criminal. True, it was immediately replaced by 25 years in the camps. Such was the fate of the others. The court is guided by the War Crimes Decree, Article 2 Violent Acts. This decree was issued by Stalin shortly after the liberation of the city named after him, in order to get Wehrmacht soldiers and their accomplices from among Soviet citizens as gratuitous slave labor. All of them are entitled to the death penalty by hanging, a measure of a clearly intimidating nature. And here we are on Christmas Eve behind bars. Everyone sings, Silent Night, Holy Night, to themselves. At this moment, the iron door opens, the warden shows up, and, looking sympathetically at us, says that he is not going to extort anything from us, that he will bring us bread, because he sympathizes with us and understands us, but he is forced to be tough with us, otherwise case, and he will be sent to Siberia, and he will never see his family again. I took these words as a glimmer of hope. The hygienic conditions in the prison were beyond all criticism. We were starving, receiving only 200 grams of bread a day and some kind of drink. The toilet served as a bucket in a dark corner. We were supposed to take a 10-minute walk, hands behind our backs, conversations are strictly prohibited. At least it was possible to look at the sky and take a breath of fresh air. After a month of this torture, we were again allowed to be ordinary prisoners and transferred to the camp. This time, for serving sentences. Cut off from the outside world, we worked according to the old, obviously overestimated, norms. We survived, and the most important thing was that we stuck together. On the construction of a huge building designed for washing coal, I worked as a concrete worker. Major General Travitz, whom we knew from Pomerania, was an auxiliary worker. Our former doctor, Dr. Bosch, who once worked with me in Dnipropetrovsk, laid the reinforcement together with Gottfried von Bismarck, we fought together near Stalingrad. And only in 1951 we, war criminals, were granted the right to notify relatives with a postcard and receive mail from them. I received one package from my parents, another from Bishop Heckel, a third from a doctor, M.D. Werner Hubner, a fourth from Major General Gunther Pape, and from other friends and acquaintances. Then, after Stalin's death, in 1953, three Russian generals reviewed my case, and sent me home. It was the same case that I showed you. I arrived from Soviet captivity on September 26, 1953, and started looking for my parents. They were expelled from our hometown and lived in East Berlin. I received a residence permit in Germany and flew to West Berlin. We met with my parents in West Berlin. Then we all returned to Germany. Then a postcard was sent to me by the same doctor who looked after me in Budapest, Dr. Hubner. He wrote, Eric, come, everything is ready. I flew to him, he operated on me again, and two months later I was completely healthy again. On April 21, 1992, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, 
I applied through our Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Bonn for a review of my sentence. In response to my inquiry, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Moscow on February 7, 1995 replied as follows. After a long check by the Russian side on January 4, 1995, we received a decision on your rehabilitation. We are glad. What battle signs of distinction have you been awarded? German Cross in Gold, Iron Cross First and Second Class, Melee Badge, Assault Badge, Silver Badge for Three Wounds. What exactly did you receive the Close Combat Award for? Fifteen Confirmed Close Combats. Could you tell at least one of the episodes? It will be hard for me to do. Fine. How did you receive the news of Germany's surprise? I found out about the surrender when I was in Budapest. We were taken to Novorossiysk somewhere in July-August. The doctor suggested that I arrange to be sent home through the Allies, I said, no, I have to go home through the Soviet Union. Then, after returning home, the question arose of what to do here. Study is too late, science is too late, the army, I promised my mother that I would not go there again. Then I went to work in finance, in a bank, and soon became responsible for the advanced training of management personnel. That was my civil career. And the Bundeswehr contacted me in 1962 and said that they needed me as a reservist. I was called up for military training, studied at the military academy in Hamburg and the military school of the Bundeswehr, I was qualified as a carrier of state secrets and subject to mobilization in case of war. At the request of General Gunther Pape, my last divisional commander, and in agreement with my employers, I am enlisted in the Bundeswehr Reserve with the rank of Major in the Reserve. I was assigned to the 3rd Panzer Division in Dortmund as a battalion commander. Periodically took part in NATO maneuvers that took place during the Cold War. All my acquaintances and friendships that arose during the years of the war and the camps have been preserved. Even before my return from the Soviet Union, a partnership of former employees of the Feldhern Hall arose. Thank you so much for the interesting interview. Yes, thank you, I was also interested. That's all for today. If you like this video, please support it with a like and subscribe to the channel. Bye everyone, see you soon.